I'm Julie Lawtons. I'm going to be your host today, and I am delighted to welcome you to our first Friday. We do this the first Friday of every month, and it's a way in which we engage from with our global community. I encourage you to type in the chat where you're Zooming in from so we have a sense of everybody who's here. I'm personally in Toronto in my home office today, and I've got a lot of the Corentis team here with me, including Alexander, who's leading the, the session with me. So welcome, delighted to see you. So our tradition is to open our first Friday with a coherence moment. And I'd invite you just to take a moment, get your hands off your keyboard and your mouse and bring your attention to your breathing. You might find your feet on the floor. You can close your eyes if you want and engage a rhythmic pattern of breathing, dropping all the way down into your belly so that you fill your body with fresh air in and out. Let that out and as you do this, you can bring attention to the area around the heart breathing through that area and bring to mind something for which you feel gratitude, a person, a place, a moment, something that helps you build that feeling of gratitude in your heart as we breathe through that sense of gratitude. It helps us come into a place of coherence and be ready for this chance to learn together. One more breath and Alexander, I'll ask you to move on to our next slide. We welcome people to this conversation from across the ways in which Corentis has engaged with the world over the years. Uh, the organization has been working for more than 20 years um, in the United States and around the world and we bring all the people that have been touched by the training together with this invitation of becoming part of the Global Practitioner Network. And some of you are clients uh, for which we're truly grateful. Um, just wanna say welcome to everyone and encourage you to join us um, in future Fridays and to be part of the conversation today. Our two thought leaders for today, I'm delighted to introduce Alexander Kaye, who I'm sure many of you know. Alexander is the co-founder and CEO of Corentis. He's our thought leader on the state of mind tool, having done research on it with colleagues over many years and having brought it to clients over a long, long period of time. And to Rob Jensen, Rob, welcome. We're delighted to have you with us. Rob is the founder of Boundless Teams. And I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself in a little bit after Alexander runs the tool. Thank you for coming and providing your perspective on this tool. Absolutely. Great to have you here, Rob. Thank you, Julie. You're welcome. And welcome to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today and to really talk about this, this wonderful topic that we've been exploring for the better part of 20 years. There is a, a study that we did um, that is on our site that you can access. It was a research piece of research we did back in 2012 with 740 global leaders. You can have access to that piece of research. We hope that you will give it a read. There's also a video online of a talk that I gave. It looks like a TED talk. It was with the Insights channel on the power of state of mind. And for us, state of mind, the the idea and the concept started, um, and, and maybe just a step back, I'm going to share some slides. We're going to do a state of mind check-in. Rob will then give his experience using state of mind in his organizations. And then we'll open it up for Q&A and have a nice conversation and get rid of the slides. Um, so the, the, the work began about 20 years ago when we became interested in the impact of state of mind on leadership. And really wanting to understand what happens to leadership, authority, and accountability, and power when state of mind plays a factor. And so 
we started to do these exercises around state of mind with our clients all over the world, the better part of 33 different countries, to gain understanding of how to talk about state of mind, how to structure state of mind, and how to bring it to our clients. We then did a research study with leaders all over the world, and we gathered a lot of really good data on state of mind, the most effective states of mind for leadership, the least effective states of mind for leadership, and the power of state of mind in terms of its impact on performance, effectiveness, and relationships. We're not going to get into all that detail today. We're just going to take a look at the tool, but it's be worthwhile digging into the report to get all of that really valuable data. We begin today with a definition of state of mind, which for us is our moment to moment experience of life as generated by our thinking and as expressed by our feelings. So it's a variable state that we encounter moment to moment. And it's an opportunity. The opportunity is for us to really become cognizant of and to notice our state of mind moment to moment and to study its impact on those around us. When we started to work with state of mind, we wanted a tool, a very simple tool to bring it to our clients. And so we develop what is the state of mind chart. You can use this with your clients. And what it is, it's six rows, three above and three below a neutral line. The three above the neutral line are upper states of mind and the three below the neutral line are lower states of mind. So we have a plus one, plus two, plus three state of mind and a minus one, minus two, minus three state of mind. Notice we don't use the words positive and negative. We use the words plus and minus. And what we do is we bring in this blank chart, put it on a whiteboard or put it on a flip chart and we have our clients fill in the blanks. And over the years of doing this with the better part of over, what is it, 2,500 people now, again, across 33 different countries, the most common words that have come up are these. And this is really across a variety of countries that at a plus one, we're satisfied, calm, and content. At a plus two, we're happy, energized, and excited. At a plus three, we're elated, euphoric, and ecstatic. At a minus one, we're stressed, tired, and anxious. Minus two, frustrated, disappointed, perhaps angry. And at a minus three, we're depressed, hopeless, and desperate. So just a, a sense for these, these different levels. Now, every client has their own words. Every client will fill it in with their own language. It's fascinating to see this work done in different countries with local language. You get a lot of different texture and a lot of different words that are used. So that's also pretty neat to do. Are there any questions on this particular slide of what we're doing here? And Julie, I'll have you monitor the, the raised hands if there's anything coming up. No, great. So with that in mind, the second exercise we like to do and where a lot of our research was around is how does, how does state of mind impact different domains of life? And so we identified a variety of domains. Some are professional, some are personal. And here is a, here is a, um, a limited list. We actually studied 44 domains in all. And we like to ask ourselves the question, what happens to these domains when different states of mind are being experienced? So the fun ones are on the far right when you study the impact of state of mind on time, money, parenting, driving, friendship, family, marriage, partnerships, self-care. But really interesting for our clients in organizational domains are the ones on the left and in the middle around leadership, collaboration, planning, organizing, et cetera. And we wanna share one with you, which we have found interesting over the years is the impact of state of mind, let's say on decision-making. And to do that, we had a client of ours, this is a marketing leadership team of a very large beauty company located in New York City who did this exercise. And so they selected six words on the left and they studied the impact of those words, those states of mind on decision-making. So for example, they selected depressed. Noticing that there are certain times when members of the team have a minus three state of mind and they notice the impact that that had on their decision-making. And this was a big aha for them as they went up 
the chain, they noticed that frustrated produced, you know, more disempowered decision making, more short short sighted, fewer perspectives, and subversive decision making. As they went up the, the list of words and the ones they chose, they noticed tired produced unsteady process, letting someone else decide, impatience. And as they went above the neutral line, they noticed that content, you know, produced sort of balanced and measured decision making, more patience, energized, produced, focused, collaborative, assured, and well thought through decisions. But interestingly, when they got to plus three, they noticed that they decided too quickly or they were over ambitious, overzealous in their decision making. So this was a way for them to study decision making. They also studied collaboration, conflict management, leadership, the notion of time, and the notion of communication. And they came away with the same result, which was that when they were in a plus one, plus two state of mind, their decision making, their collaboration, their overall approach to conflict management, et cetera, was more balanced. Now, really importantly, and this is something that we make sure that we state, we never make the assertion, nor do we hold the assumption that being above the line is better than being below the line, nor do we say that it is good or bad, right or wrong. Instead, what we say is that it's variable and that we all are going to have variable states of mind and we're going to move through them throughout the day. We also work with leaders in a coaching capacity to let them know that it is actually okay for leaders to be below the line. So many leaders have this assumption that they need to be constantly above the line when they're not feeling it. And in certain ones of our systems, leaders have become okay with and comfortable with sharing that perhaps they're a minus one. And they do that by sharing it with their teams or with their direct reports. And it's created a little bit more buoyancy in the system when it's okay to understand that as a leader, you don't always have to be above the line. So that's just a, a note to be careful of because sometimes we get into this wrong assumption that it is about being above the line. And that's the way that life needs to be when it is absolutely not true. So you'll see in our research that we had a lot of really interesting findings. And there are three key findings I wanna share with you, several of which we've already spoken about, but the first finding is that it's variable. In coaching clients, we have them hold these little state of mind charts where they gauge their state of mind throughout the day. And many of our clients are surprised to find how variable their states of mind are throughout the day. And how that variability really impacts their performance and productivity moment to moment. The second finding that we have is that it's really a personal lens through which we see the world. That when we look at a piece of data, whether we're in a plus one, plus two, or minus one, minus two state of mind, that data looks differently. I often joke that the people I love the most look markedly different when I'm in a plus two state of mind than when I'm in a minus two state of mind. And I keep blaming <laughs> them for ship shifting, but actually it's not really the case. They don't shape shift, excuse me. It's my state of mind that has shifted and it has produced for me a different data set. And it's important to be accountable for that and to own it and to own our states of mind, especially if we're in positions of power, leadership, or influence. And the third finding, which is backed up by a lot of the work that Daniel Co Goleman talked about in emotional intelligence is around impact, that our state of mind is contagious. It has a contagion effect, especially if we're in positions of leadership or power or authority. And so it's important to know that if we're walking into a meeting as a leader with a minus two or minus one state of mind, that the members of that meeting might just take on that state of mind and the meeting might find itself in a minus one, minus two state of mind. Owning that state of mind and sharing it might dispel that contagion. It might not, but it may. And that can be very helpful for a leader to own it and to say as such. So finally, one of the tools that we love to use is the team state of mind check-in. On a whiteboard or on a flip chart, we like to create a visual representation of the state of mind chart that looks something like this and to check in from time to time with the team to see where they're at. 
The beauty of the chart is it allows you to check in on states of mind to see how team members are doing or how a group is doing. And they can use numerical answers, plus one, plus 0.5, plus 0.75, minus one, minus 0.5, et cetera. And so at the start of the meeting, you may get a response that looks like that. This is the beginning of your meeting and you might do a state of mind check-in, numerical answers. They may choose to use words that go along with that. They can use numerical answers and you get a sense where people are in the room. Now, what we like to do at Corentis and what several of our clients like to do is to ask those who are on the line or below the line if they need anything. And oftentimes they need to complete an email. Sometimes they need a break. Sometimes they're just where they're at and they need nothing. It just happens to be their state of mind, which is okay. You may go through a first couple of work sessions in the meeting or first couple of topics and check in again, and you may get this result. And here everybody's above the line, which tells you that the session that you just had probably produced a pretty positive effect on the members of the team. You may check in later and get something that looks like this, in which case you may want to check in with folks again. Where are people at? What just happened in the session before that? What's going on? And let those who are below the line maybe express how they're feeling, what they're thinking, or what's going on for them. And then not that this would be the end of a meeting, but sometimes we get patterns that look like this was a great disparity between the states of mind. And this can be an interesting way to explore to see what's happening in the room or with the team. Sometimes there's an option to complement your numerical answer with a descriptive word. So people may say, I'm tired today, or I'm just frustrated, or I'm feeling calm, or I'm content, or I'm jazzed, I'm excited, I'm psyched, whatever it is. It's an option. Many of our teams like to stick with the numerical data because the words tend to be more intrusive or require too much of them. So any questions on the state of mind check-in? Alexander, I have one. Please, Kate. Can you say a, little, a, a few words about the value of checking in at different times in, of, in the meeting? The value, maybe the impact of that on the team? Yeah, I would love to. I think it's valuable when you have very long meetings. Mm. I wouldn't see it being valuable for a 45 minute, one hour meeting. I think a uh, check-in at the beginning is good enough. You may want to do a check out. But right. if you have a very long meeting that's going over the course of four, five, six hours, maybe you have a full day retreat. We have uh, a partner in um, Zurich, Switzerland, who does a lot of full day retreats and he does a check-in in the morning, a check-in at noon and a check-in at the end of the day. And sometimes he'll check in if that meeting has a lot of different modules comprised of it, if it has challenging sessions, and he keeps a record of it throughout the day, so it's helpful. Oh, nice. Question in the time four zone. Um, you've got the, the outliers there. Do you or would you suggest approaching or how would you approach the person who had gone to a, a, a minus two? or had lowered than that? Would you actually have a conversation? Would you seek to have a conversation? How would you approach it? So the majority of our clients keep it general and generic, Mike, which is, does anybody want to share anything? Okay. Versus pointing somebody out, which may feel intrusive. So that person I, may choose to speak or not. I think we have to be a little careful not to put people on the spot. Yeah. I think that's important. So I would just say, keep it more generic, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Basically the same question as Mike's because I, I think that if there's one outlier on a negative, you know, that's, I mean, very much more negative than everyone else. It, it, I, I understand and appreciate your answer. Um, and, and I still wonder about it because they've identified that they're really not in a good state of mind and everyone is aware of that. I mean, every, people can move on, but I was, that's, that's the same curiosity that I have. Yeah. We have one client that's been using this for the better part of three years and they've gotten to a point, Hillary, where they can call each other out. Mm. So if that was you, Hillary, we might say, Hillary, what's going on? And it's very natural and very normal. And you put mm -hmm. minus 2.5 and you're going to have a conversation and share that. Lori. Um, 
I don't mean for this to sound facetious, but how does, when you have a long meeting, how does taking lunch or doing breaks impact the group and how they show up? I think it has a very powerful effect, Lori. I wouldn't underestimate it. Long breaks, stretching sessions, team building, <clears throat> collaborative sessions, a good lunch, some show, social time will impact state of mind tremendously. And I think good facilitators in their design know how to balance the amount of work with the amount of play so that it's um, so that it's really shared. Thank, Thank you, Lori. And Peter. Oh, uh, thanks. I'm I'm just wondering if you whether you're doing this in person or remotely. Let's say you have a group of nine people. Is there an uh, easy way to do these graphs? Um, is there an app for it? Oh, got it. We have people put their number in chat. We we did design at one point a little tool that had a state of mind chart, which people then polled themselves. And the tool took the polling and made a map of the states of mind. We've used that in the past as well, Peter. Okay. Alexander, we've been talking about doing more polling, just using Zoom features recently and how that can break up the monotony of Zoom. So that's something we could consider. I don't, how do you think that would work? I think it would work well. I think polling would be great, Julie. All right then, so I have the pleasure of introducing my friend, my longtime colleague and an ex-client, Rob Jensen. Um, personally speaking, you know, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself, Rob, and talk a bit about your experience with the tool. But personally speaking, Rob is a friend, first and foremost, and we've been on a journey together for many, many years, supporting each other in a variety of ways, both professionally and personally. Rob is one of those gentlemen um, who abides by a very strong set of values and code of ethics and is a consummate professional, someone that I respect tremendously and that I look up to and who has helped me personally over some very difficult times. So thank you for that, Rob. Well, thank you for all your support over the years and uh, teaching me all these tools so I could use them effectively and, and teach others. And it's been a, it's been a great experience. And um, so let me just give a little bit of, little bit of history. Uh, first of all, where I am today, uh, I, I am retired and I live in the uh, Southeast corner of South Dakota and can basically see the state of Nebraska and the state of Iowa from within a mile or so of my home. Uh, I still do some executive and team coaching locally. I work pro bono for organizations that need it. Uh, and I only, uh, one of the restrictions I place on my time is I only work for organizations where the leader, or in the case of a partnership, both leaders, uh, are completely bought in to changing the way that they do business through the kinds of tools that Corinthus uh, provides. Um, my LinkedIn profile is under Robert Jensen. Uh, feel free to go out there and take a look. Uh, I started using these tools uh, way back before Corinthus was Corinthus. I, I believe it was something else at the time, Alexander, when you first came in. And uh, uh, at that time, I was running a $150 million uh, a year vertical uh, for a company that does about between two and a half and $3 billion a year with the U.S. government. And as I learned each tool, uh, after I thought I had them not mastered, but to the point where I could at least help my team by using them, I cascaded uh, all of these tools down through my organization, all the way down to, uh, to the smaller um, subordinate teams. After I left that particular company, I did my, uh, my capstone uh, position as the president and CEO of an association, Global Association, 
in healthcare technology. And um, I also used uh, all of all of the tools at that position. So what what you'll hear me um, kind of chat about here a little bit is not necessarily the uh, sort of the academic and the research side that that make the foundation for state of mind, but how in practice I have found it to be effective uh, with the teams uh, that I've uh, been with. I can say um, I've been using state of mind in every leadership meeting that I am the meeting owner for over 15 years. Uh, we began and ended the meetings with state of mind. And when we had, uh, especially when there was decision making uh, on the agenda, then I would call out a separate time for uh, a state of mind at the end of those sessions. And the reason I did that is, um, as you saw when Alexander showed the research, uh, the decisions that you get during times where the state of mind uh, is either plus or minus or scattered is, is a different, potentially a different quality decision than you would have gotten had the state of mind as a team been better. So uh, from a leadership perspective, and, and this is where I'll ask you to grant me a little grace, is that I was not only the team leader, uh, but also the coach learning coach practitioner in the room. So I was filling both roles, uh, did not have sort of the, the way to step out of that. The plus to that is if you're a leader and you go deep and you show and share who you are authentically and how you're feeling authentically, uh, it will over time bring the team to that point where Alexander was making the point. If your team is, uh, is very developed, they will learn to hold each other accountable and those uh, those outliers will get answered before the team really leaves the room. In 15 years, uh, there's been a couple of, uh, there's been about a dozen times, I went back when Alexander asked me to take a look at this, about a dozen times where we had someone that came into the room that was a, uh, a minus three, where we have, the, the minus three was serious enough where we effectively set the agenda aside and spent all of that all of that team time uh, figuring out what the person needed with them, assigning it and taking on commitments to help them. And then if we and then leaving the room and doing what needed to be done. And that went all the way down to uh making meals for someone whose husband had just gone into the hospital and had children that were coming home in the afternoon. And it was the kind of situation, all dozen of those situations were the kinds of situations where uh, I define a team as some as a, a group of people that has your back. Um, that's the shorthand. And uh, that's the time where you either step up and you're really a team or you're a working group. So uh, we would always uh, sort of table, if you will, the agenda in favor of the people. The people were more important than the business in each and every case. Um, for those at the opposite end of the spectrum, what I found was uh, for those that were plus threes, uh, it gave, the opportunity for the group to understand people at a different level. Um, I think I'm not a leader that that takes a lot of care. I'll just I'll share that right now that I I do push people somewhat. So when and Alexander is the opposite of me, which we, we always a good team in the room because he was not very intrusive, and I and I wouldn't call myself intrusive, but I would always ask. Is there something that you need to clear if they were below the line? 
And is there something you'd like to share if they were above the line? And um, in a lot of cases, folks that were in that, in that uh, plus three area, they would have no other opportunity in the work environment to share with that team. They might have friends that were in the work environment um, that they would share with one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one or over lunch. But what I was counting on in those teams and um, was to help develop each person to a point where they're all showing up as their whole authentic person and the sum of those whole authentic people together makes a team. There was also uh, say another two dozen-ish uh, times where there was either an outlier or two, where as the leader, I felt that I needed to figure out what that was about. And we modified the schedule or the agenda on the spot to take time to do that to determine okay do we have do we need to solve something that lives in this in our team state of mind before we go do some of this work um, from a leadership perspective i was always cognitive cognitive that the quality of the work that we do will be directly reflected by the management of the state of mind during the meeting and during each work session. So um, there was about two dozen different occasions uh, over that 15 years where there was serious enough um, concerns or where there was enough uh, joy. It, it went both ways where there was uh, certain parts of the team that were so celebratory that we I didn't think we could calm down enough to actually have a meaningful meeting. So. It, it 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 goes both ways and really it's it's up to the leader and and the coach to kind of figure out do we do we have the do we have the whole people in the room right now that we're counting on to bring their expertise to the business problems one thing i'll i'll point out as a as a practitioner is um each person on on the teams the the more you know them they will have a norm. They'll have a section around the state of mind chart that they're generally in, okay? Um, and that's okay. It's, it's like, like Alexander said, it's variable. For me as a leader, when I would see that, and when I saw them rate outside of where they normally were, that was, that was the key to say, is there something we can do to help with that? Or would you like to share more about, you know, why you're feeling so great today? So let me, let me just stop there and let, I, I'm a, I'm a very practical person. Ask anything that, uh, that you like. I can tell you that I've, I've done this. I can do this in my sleep today. Um, and, and let me just say, it's not new to any of you. You might think it's new to you, but you do it in your house. You do it on your sports teams. You see it on you see it in your kids' practices uh, when they when they go to ballet. Why are you why are you not feeling good right now? Um, so it's a matter of putting a little structure around that for your being a team practitioner coach. What is the relationship between uh, the leader bringing forth the state of mind um, exercise and the development of trust and safety in the group? So I I think that um, well like I said at the beginning I, I don't I don't work with teams where the leader doesn't 100 percent kind of support um, where we might be going in this to fully develop people and fully develop the team um, I personally think that to develop the thinking side of the equation uh, and not develop the heart and soul side of the equation is, is really a leader falling short in their, in their job. What you're trying to, you're trying to figure out where is the heart of my team at this moment? Not, it, it's great to know the individuals and, to, and you want to take care of all those, but where are we as a group? 
And I think it has a direct bearing on trust, direct. And the response to especially people that are approaching crisis, whether uh, it's a two, uh, a, ne a negative two or a, a, minus, a minus two or minus three, the response to that will map itself in trust across your whole organization. I'm just going to build on that, Rob, and, and ask about confidentiality and what kind of confidentiality you ask for around these conversations. I always preface everything with, I, I leave it up to the individual. I, I do not, I do not press them beyond their comfort level. When in doubt, I, if there's anything I, I will just pull them aside after or ask them, invite them to my office and say, if you need to go home, go home. And yeah. if there's anything we can help with, let us know. Yeah. I mean, they have to be first. In, in any business, you 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 have no business without your people. Mary, thank you so much. This is fascinating. Um, if you have taken the state of mind um, beforehand, is there anything that um, that you can contribute to alignment at more alignment at the end? Anything that you do or or saw? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so one of the things we would take it at the beginning and the end, and I would always note without any kind of prejudice one way or the other, okay, it looks like it looks like we as a team came down about half a point during the session. Is there anybody who would like to make a comment about that? Or it looks like this particular work session um, really seemed to boost our our buoyancy in the room. It, can anybody share why that was for you personally and and we would try to uh kind of not map but at least associate you know what are the topics that are going to be tough for us for through the year what are the topics that are going to be easy for us during the year we could schedule less time some of this we could do by uh you know by zoom on the other hand those tough topics let's all get in the room let's let's make sure we're all there Thank you. Have you ever encountered a situation where you, you did a check-in on a state of mind and most of the team were below the line and you asked them why and you discovered that it was a team, there was a big team issue that they were dealing with that emerged as a result that maybe you weren't aware of? That happened exactly once. Uh, Alexander was actually there when this happened. <laughs> and uh, it blew up a two day offsite. Wow. Uh, I was the leader, Alexander was the, the team coach and we uh, essentially on the fly had to replan a team offsite and the repercussions of of that uh, lasted a good four months after that. So without giving away any secrets, was it a content issue that blew up the site, the, the, the offsite, or was it a behavioral issue? It was a role and responsibility issue where I had made a decision uh, without consultation on my team because it was a, uh, it was a personnel decision of someone that reported directly to me. So it was a teammate that I had made a decision about that did not show up in the room for the offsite. And that's when they learned about it. Thank um, you. Now, to be honest uh, and fair to the team, uh, I would say, and Alexander, jump in there, you were there. Um, I would say that there was at least half the team that anticipated that saw this was coming and thought it was the right thing and then there was sort of this other faction that thought oh you, you should have consulted all of us and you had no right to do this and and that was it but i was uh, let me say i was glad to have a professional coach during that offsite <laughs> <laughs> we just redesigned the offsite we did we did on the fly 
on the fly, redesigned it on the fly. And it just shows how effective really the, the tools that Corentis has and the ability to pivot uh, when you need to are. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for the question. I, I, I was going to tell that story and I didn't know if I, if I should or not, but I'm glad. You did. I'll remember it forever. <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, we are out of time, my friends. It is 1246. So we want to do two things. We'll end with Julie's mindfulness moment. But first, I just want all of you maybe get come off mute and just give Rob uh, a, a thank you. Thank you, Rob. Anytime. Thank you, Rob. Thank Anytime. you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much, Rob. My contact info is on LinkedIn. If you uh, if you yeah. want to connect or if you ever just want to have a chat by phone, happy to do it. Okay, Julie, to you, take us out and then we'll let everybody get back to their day. Thank you, Alexander. So we wrap our sessions. Our tradition is to wrap our sessions with a mindfulness moment where we invite you to close your eyes, take a breath. And I'm going to ask you two questions. One is, What's an insight, a learning, an unlearning, a relearning that you're taking away today? And what's your state of mind as you leave this meeting? Thank you very much, Rob, for joining us. Thank you all for being with us. We'll see you next first Friday, which is April the 5th. And we'd love to have you come back and be part of the conversation.